Let's give the Lord a hand of praise. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Revelation. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 1. After these things I heard, as it were, a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory, power belongs to our God. There is something about singing praises to God. If you don't do it now, you will do it in heaven. I think um, we need to uh, practice uh, getting our shout on. I know some people feel uncomfortable shouting. I know, I, that's okay, that's okay. I know some folks to Diddy like that. I know that. That's okay, that's, that's okay. I know some folks really conservative in their prayer. That, that, that's okay, that's okay. But when you get to heaven, you're going to be uncomfortable. <laughs> I just want you to know, when you get to heaven, you're going to be uncomfortable. Because there is no quiet place in heaven for you to just stand there meditating like that. <laughs> I'm sorry. There's nothing but giving God praise when you get to his goodness. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Okay, okay. Let's calm down. Let's calm down. I don't know about you. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me read the scripture. I, I, I didn't even read the scripture. Open your Bibles with me, Revelation chapter 19. If you're there, thank you for turning those pages. I can hear them. Let's read this passage, Revelation 19. After these things I heard, as it were, a loud voice of great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah! Hallelujah. Salvation and glory and power belongs to our God. Because his judgments are true and righteous. For he has judged the great harlot who was corrupting the earth with her immorality. And he was, uh, he has avenged the blood of his bond servants on her. And a second time they said, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sits on the throne. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> And a voice came from the throne saying, Give God praise to our God, all you, his bondservants, you who fear him, the small and the great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude and the sound of many waters and as the sound of mighty peals of thunder saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. I just want you to know today, that even if you don't feel like praising him now, you don't have a choice later. <laughs> so seeing that this is your practice ground, you might as well practice just praising him now. Uh, feel uncomfortable and don't worry about the person on the side of you. You didn't come here to worship them, you came to worship God. So when God says shout, <laughs> Hallelujah. I think we should just give him that praise. Hallelujah. That belongs to him. Hallelujah. It's not about us. Oh, man. See, I know some folk just nervous right now. They'd be like, what's going on, right? Here's the thing. I've, I've, I've been all over the place, seeing different churches and so on and so forth. And some people like to jump and shout and scream and when it's all said and done, Monday through Saturday, they don't even know who Jesus is. And then some people like to open the Bible and talk about the Bible a lot, but Monday through Saturday, they don't know who Jesus is. See, there is something about the person who know who Jesus is and, and what he has done. But not just who he is, not just what he has done, but what he's going to do. <laughs> the fact that he is coming back and when we see the return of Christ, all we're hearing is hallelujah, 
Hallelujah. Praise is going up to God, and it's not no silent praise. Voices are being lifted, a multitude upon multitudes are lifting him up and giving him praise. Even the dead in Christ that has risen, they are giving him praise. Every single thing that has breath, giving him praise. So right now, I want you to place your religion in your pocket because your voice belongs to God. And there's nothing greater you can say right now that can give more praise than to say, Hallelujah. The angels are going to shout out, Hallelujah. The 24 elders will shout out, Hallelujah. Everything that is living has breath will shout out, Hallelujah. So we might as well just shout, Hallelujah. Uh, Father God, we love you. We give you praise, oh God, and simply ask that you would inhabit the praises of your people. With all the crazy things that's taking place in this world, you are sitting and reigning on your throne, and you have already purposed everything, the beginning before the end, and the end before the beginning, and everything in between, oh God, you've orchestrated so we thank you for being the great and the awesome God that you are. As we go through this time, oh God, we celebrate you. We worship you. Allow your Holy Spirit to direct our hearts and our minds in the reading of your word. That you would be glorified in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I'm so glad to be back. Uh, <laughs> praise God. I have a, a six-week series that's going to culminate all my study in Revelation, a six-week series called After It's All Said and Done. After It's All Said and Done. I know we are going through a lot. Um, each and every one of us have different uh, trials and tribulations that we're going through. We have various things that we're experiencing, and we try to find answers for all the things that ail us in life. If we don't have a job, we try to find a better job, so we go and try to get a better education and and, and find, a, find a trade, and we try to do things to make our life better. That's all good. But as Solomon says, it's sort of like striving after the wind. Because every time you think you've gotten what you were looking for, it doesn't feel as good as you thought it was going to feel. When you arrive at your destination, you realize, I should have gone somewhere else. <laughs> Things is never quite what they are, what we imagine them to be. However, <laughs> there is something better than we can ever imagine it to be. That is the presence of God. And this is what we have to look forward to. We saw as we were going through uh, the book of Revelation, we focus a lot on chapter 4 through chapter 18, what is called the seven-year tribulation. And we were on that for a minute. I know um, most of you are glad that we're done with that, right? And some of you are saying, I just can't wait till you get done with the book. Six weeks. Six weeks. <laughs> In Revelation chapter 19 and verse 1, we come to a very interesting place. This chronologically flows right after chapter 18, where the economic system was judged. It's called Babylon, the harlot. Babylon is judged in Revelation 18, the world economic system. In chapter 17 of Revelation, Babylon, the church or the religious system was judged. And we saw how she came in chapter 17 how the church was riding or the religious system was riding the back of the government and the government turned around and destroyed the religious system because the government wanted worship for itself and I'm speaking very clearly so that you would understand and I'm not saying the beasts or the harlot because you need to understand it's religion and government you need to understand religion and government will amalgamate they will come together. They will merge as one. And then the government will want worship for itself, so it will destroy the religious system and make a governmental religious system. You can call it communism or whatever you want to call it, but that's what it's going to be, where the government will be worshipped. 
And this man who's running the governmental system called the Antichrist, he's called Antichrist because he makes himself out to be Christ. He'll be killed and come back to life. The religious system will make an image of this man, and the image will come to life. It's crazy, the things that we see. So Revelation chapter 19 and verse 1 brings us to a very climactic place. Because after all the great judgment has happened, it says after these things, after the seven-year tribulation, after the perilous times that came upon the earth, after the Antichrist set up his place in Jerusalem, signed the peace treaty, broke the peace treaty, brought forth um, um, great persecution on the people of God, after he set up a system where everyone around the world had to, in order to buy or sell, accept his mark. And God at that time had 144,000 Jewish men who were going out and witnessing and preaching the gospel. And people were getting saved. And as they were getting saved, the government was killing them. They were coming after them and, and taking their lives because they were worshiping Jesus Christ. Goes back to what Jesus said, that they would, if they persecuted me, they'll persecute you also because the servant cannot be any better than the master. And that makes me think in this modern era, how is it that when we look at church history, the only time the church grew was in persecution. And we're sitting in luxury and we're believing the church is growing because we're seeing people coming into buildings not understanding that that's the sign of the end time. They will accumulate unto themselves, teach us in accordance with their own desires. How do you know that this is the last days when the churches are so large but people are spiritually dead? When the folks sitting down in the church don't know what holiness means. Have no idea what it means to be church or who Jesus Christ truly is. But they truly have a religion. Oh, see that is what's going to be taking place and we're seeing it being set up now. This false religion is going to come up, and folks in the church will persecute people in the church because there will be the wheat among the tares, and the tares will try to tear down the wheat. And it shows, Jesus, when he gave the parable of the tares and the wheat, showed that the evil one came in and planted the tares among the wheat. So when you see folks in church today, any church that you hear, Jesus is not being elevated and the gospel is not the center, you know that that is not a true church. Doesn't matter how charismatic the man is who's speaking. It doesn't matter how many people are attending. That has no bearing on the fact if Jesus Christ is not being proclaimed, it is not a church. And I'm not speaking about the Jesus folks speaking about that pacified Jesus who run around with a rainbow and people saying that, you know, he just love everyone and all their sin and all their filth and make him out to be this strange, weird, twisted American thing. No, I'm speaking of the Jesus who always was. He has no beginning. He has no end. He is Alpha. He is Omega. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He was in the beginning with God. This Jesus, who literally, who created Mary, went into her womb, came out of her womb, went to a tomb so, she could, so He could save His mother, who He created. So we need to understand the Jesus who I'm speaking of isn't the Jesus who people serve today. Most people have a Jesus that was made by Hollywood. This is a Jesus who, he says, he accepts you as you are. Now, mind you, some truth wrapped up in a lie is still a lie. Because when people say, Jesus, accept you as you are, what they're trying to say is, you don't have to change anything. Your mind doesn't need to be renewed. You don't need to be transformed. You can still be living in sin, clubbing, doing everything, but just call on Jesus. Just like the rappers on BET, when they go to accept their award, man, I like to thank God. No, nah. no, nah. I don't know who you're talking about. I, we believe I've, I've, I've been seeing a lot of little documentaries and stuff, and I'm like, man, I'm going to keep preaching it. Because now they have queer churches downtown Dallas. It's crazy. Whole denominations accepting immorality and perversion. But I'm not discouraged because the Bible said it's going to happen. 
And so it comes about, you know, we went through that for the past two years. So I'm not going to jump back into that. Because the verse says, after the great tribulation time, after the seven seals and the seven trumpets and the seven bowls, and, and now the woes came, the three woes, woe, 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 and now Babylon the Great is being judged. It says, after these things I heard something like a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to God. Now this is interesting. The Hebrew word, that says hallelujah is the word halal which means praise now we find in the hebrew vernacular there are several different words Toda, yoda halal barak zema shabak and tehillah uh, all these words when you see it in the english it just says praise so when you see the english words praise you even don't you really don't know what it's saying because when it says praise it could mean to lift your hands when it says praise it could mean to shout when it says praise it could mean to Jump, that's what it says, to jump for joy. When it says praise, it could mean to play a string instrument. When it said praise, it could mean to play a wind instrument. When it says praise, it could mean to clap your hands. So when you see the word praise, based on the context, it can mean several different things. But the root that we have, this word called halal, the word called halal is to make shine or to boast on something to rave about something to celebrate <laughs> so it's interesting that this word halal is being used not Toda, not yoda not halal sorry not shabak not tehillah but this word here halal which is the highest praise it's like to boast about god to with a exuberant voice to declare who he is it's all about him when you halal and it's interesting because when you look at Psalms chapter 111 to 112 and Psalms 135, they begin with hallelujah. When you look at Psalms 104 to 105, 115 to 116, it ends with hallelujah. But when you look at Psalms 106, 113, 117, 146 to 150, it begins and ends with hallelujah. Now, if you read the Psalms, I'm going to take from Psalms 146 to 150 and just Use the beginning verse and the end verse. Psalms 146. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord while I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, all the generations. Praise the Lord. Psalms 147. Praise the Lord. For it is good to sing praises to our God. For it is pleasant and praise is becoming. He has not dealt thus with any nation. And as for his ordinances, they have not known them. Praise the Lord. Psalms 148, verse 1 through 4 and verse 14. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise the Lord in the heights. Praise him, all of his angels. Praise him, all of his hosts. Praise him, the sun. Praise him, the moon. Praise him, all the stars and all the lights. Praise him in the highest of heavens. And he has lifted up his horn for his people. Praise for all his godly ones, even for the sons of Israel, a people near to him. Praise the Lord. Psalms 149. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. And his praise in the congregation of the godly ones to execute on them the judgment written that is an honor for all the godly ones praise the Lord now it's interesting right here in Psalms before I get to Psalms 150 uh, Psalms 149 and verse 1 it says praise the Lord knows what it says sing to the Lord a new song and his praise in the <laughs> yeah yeah, it says, praise him in the congregation. So when you say hallelujah together with a loud voice, it's song sort of like Revelation 19, verse, chap, verse 1 and 5, where the multitude are saying hallelujah. But guess what? This was given to Israel way beforehand that they should shout 
Hallelujah. And even in the church, Paul says, continually sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, making melody in your heart towards God at all times. We're always supposed to be shouting a, a, a praise shout to God. Hallelujah. Boasting in God, bragging about God. Listen, I know people brag about their basketball team and football teams when they talk about God. Don't you find that strange? If my God is my God, if he is the creator of the world, if he created DNA, if he spoke and everything came into existence, if he took dirt and bread into it and man became a living soul, if that is my God, you're trying to tell me I can break my fingers clapping for some cowboy, but I can't come in church and break my fingers giving him glory? I can't wake up in the morning and clap my hands. See, the reason why we can't clap our hands in church is because we don't clap our hands at home. If you're not used to praising God, you ain't going to come here and do it. So that's why praising God's strange. Because you'd be like, well, what y'all doing? Well, well, I know what I'm doing. I'm doing what I do when I'm in my car. I do what I'm doing. Man, sometimes I'm walking in Walmart. People think I'm crazy. I have my earpiece on. I'm going to sing my song. I don't care. <laughs> Why? Because I don't know what's going to happen when I walk outside. <laughs> See, think about this. Imagine when your time comes, you're praising God because you don't know when it's going to come. You could be driving your car. If you're driving your car listening to the wrong thing, imagine you're at home watching the wrong thing. You get a heart attack. And the last thing you see was some desperate people calling themselves wives. I mean, Im praise is becoming of the people of God because it looks good on you. Why does it look good on you? Because you're boasting of the Father. I mean, what else is there to boast of? Some leather going in a rim? Or some dude catching leather? We can boast of that, but we can't boast of the one who created Adams. Like, we can talk about the things that we like, but we can't talk about God. It's like some people are ashamed when they're around family to talk about God because they know their family are crazy, right? And they're going to be tripping. As soon as you say, Jesus, you know everyone got that crazy uncle. I'm just going to start slurring because he's already drunk or something and saying a bunch of craziness and we all have that family member who believe they know God but they have no standard or have no idea of holiness or what it means to be a believer in God and so sometimes we are ashamed of God before wretched people sometimes we are ashamed to pronounce the truth of God because his holy standards contradicts the lifestyle of fake Christians. And so when we're around the people who are supposed to be holy, not, I'm not talking about the people in the world. I'm talking about the people in the church who like the world out. See, we need to understand something. You know this New Testament that everyone likes to read. The, thing we call, the things we call the epistles that comes, after the God, that comes after the book of Acts, you know, Romans and 1st and 2nd Corinthians and Ephesians and Galatians and Colossians and 1st and 2nd Thessalonians and Titus and Philemon and, you know, 1st and 2nd Timothy, those, James and 1st uh, and 2nd Peter and 1st, 2nd and 3rd John and Jude, you know, those epistles. Do you know all those were written to the church? You know that? Do you see what it was saying? It's interesting because when most Christians read it and see how Paul and Peter and James and John and Jude are addressing false teachers and people living immoral lifestyles, you read it thinking they're talking about the world. But no, they're talking about the church. Worlding out. Huh, that's interesting. Nothing has changed. I guarantee you there are people in here right now who world out. Living a lie, hiding and pretending. 
putting on a show. Listen, God is in your secret place. He's right there. And you could perpetrate a fraud, but he knows true. And the crazy thing is, he's still calling you. <laughs> he's still calling me. <laughs> because we were all in the same place. Because I was in church playing church too. I just, you know, got convicted. And the Spirit started to do something in me. But guess what? Every single morning, like this morning, he says, I ain't done with you yet. Because I still got those idiosyncrasies called sin that I have to deal with. Because I still shout. And I don't mean hallelujah. I mean, I get mad sometimes for no reason because I'm all in my flesh. And Paul said to buffet that flesh. And so I'm practicing. I'm practicing. I'm training myself. And it's hard, man. It's hard trying to live right in an ungodly world. It's hard trying to be a Christian in the church. Church people crazy. Y'all know what I'm talking about. It might be you. <laughs> might be me. But church people crazy. Why? Because we just people. Broken. Hurting. People who God uses for his glory. And that's the beautiful thing about it. Is that no matter how much we mess up, once we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. He's always, he's always going, but watch this. There's a difference between messing up and having a lifestyle. If you do it every single day and say, God, I'm sorry, you're lying. Stop doing it. If you're struggling, that's one thing. But if, you're, if your struggle is, man, you know what, God going to forgive me, that ain't a struggle. That's a lifestyle. God is here. This whole idea of singing praises to God is just so awesome. I'm going to, this Psalms 150 only has six verses. Each verse shouts a praise. I'm going to put it up there. So I want you to read it with me. Psalms 150, I'm reading from the NASB. Let's read together. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty expanse. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the trumpet sound. Praise him with the harp and the lyre. Praise him with the trimble and dancing. Praise him with sing. Mm. Praise him with a loud. Praise him. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Wait a minute. So hold up. Hold up. All right, let's see right here. Sam, it said praise him. <laughs> Sam, you can break on your dance and no one can't stop you. Just praise the Lord in your dance. Of course, you know, it don't mean the club dance. Don't. I was going to do something just now, but I saw Fred, so I'm not going to do it. He probably take a picture, put it on Instagram or something. But don't praise the Lord like this, man. Y'all know those things y'all used to do uh, last week? We praise the Lord <laughs> according to the holiness that he has lavished upon us, right? We praise him because he's worthy of it. He's worthy of it. That's why when um, there are so many versions of the song, you're worthy of it all, but every time CeCe Winan sings it, it's like my heart just skips five beats. It's like something about her voice. I think the angels in heaven sound like CeCe Winan. Like when they talk, it come out like CeCe Winan's, right? You're worthy of it all. No, let me not do that because I will mess everything up. <laughs> the word here we see, hallelujah, right? Um, in the Greek, 
It borrows from the Hebrew word, which means praise Yahweh. It's an expression of praise. Hallelujah, to praise God. And so it says, after these things I heard like a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belongs to God. Again, this is a familiar cry because we saw in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 through 10, it says, after these things, I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could count from every nation and all the tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robe and palm branches were in their hands and they cried out with a loud voice saying, salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne around the elders and the four living creatures and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying amen blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever amen there is this crazy thing in heaven called praise and it's non-stop. And everyone who gets there, as soon as they get there, open their mouth and starts to praise God. I know, I've heard it said, and I've said things like before, like when I get to heaven, I can't wait to see like Paul and ask him this question or Adam and ask him why. Can't wait to see Enoch and ask him what it was like to walk with God and be no more. Can't wait to talk to Elijah to ask him, did you actually go up in a whirlwind or was it? Well, tell me exactly what happened, Elijah. But I want to know how you killed those 450 guys with one sword and it was only you, Elijah. How did you do that with your sword flying, Elijah? See, I was thinking that I would be asking uh, 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 questions of people and then I realized that no, no, no. Mm -mm. When I get to heaven... Ain't no time to ask nobody no questions. Because every sense, every sensory part of me will be renewed at that time. My mind will be so saturated with the presence of the holy that I cannot then think about what was in my sin mind before because that mind is gone and he has given me a new heart. So says Isaiah, he will write his words on our heart and he will remove the heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh and we will be his people and he will be our God and we have no need for laws anymore because his words will be written on our hearts. When I get to the presence of God for a thousand years at least, I will, I will then realize where I am because I will be there shouting and screaming at least for a thousand years. Then 10,000 years are going to go by and I will be saying hallelujah, glory, 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 hallelujah. And it'll be like a second. See, I know you're thinking, right, that's a long time. No, there is no time in eternity. When we practice what we're supposed to practice, we, 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 we think of the things of God so finitely that we believe that when we get to heaven, we will do earthly things or ask earthly questions. Can I tell you that you will be so enamored with the presence of God that any question you have now will be completely irrelevant for all eternity. The questions you have now will not exist anymore because your nature will not exist anymore. Your thought process, how you think will not exist anymore because he will fashion you into a new creation. By the way, the process has already started. When you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you started eternity at that moment. At that moment when you believe that Christ died for your sins and rose from the dead, at that moment that you place your faith and trust in Christ Jesus, you gained eternity right then. Even though this body is corrupted and is decaying and is dying, your soul is living forever. And we will be in the presence of God as we will see when we get the chapter, the beautiful chapters of 20, 21 and 22. Living in the presence of God, we cannot even imagine. This is why we see now the multitudes in heaven shouting out and giving God praise because the only thing they can do in the presence of God is to give Him praise. I don't think you understand when you get in the presence of the unexplainable. You don't have a lot of words. Notice, not a lot of words are being spoken in heaven by those who are there. The first time we see the man, the 24 elders, and then we see the creatures, all they're saying is, holy, holy, holy. 
Then we see the multitude, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Ain't a lot of words in heaven. I mean, that's all folks saying. Why? When you get in the presence of God, you will then realize that you are in the presence of God. This is why it was so difficult for Israel to understand when the presence of God came down the mountain, Exodus chapter 20. When the presence of God came, the people were afraid. The lightning and the thunder, the earth shaking, everything around them moving. And God spoke to Moses and they heard his voice and it was like the sound of thunder. So imagine someone speaking, but when they speak, it's thunder. Now, I'm sure some of you heard thunder before, right? You're in Texas. You probably heard it once or twice. <laughs> when you hear thunder, imagine the loudest thunder you can possibly hear continuously going over like it's someone speaking. I'm sorry. I've been where there was a loud thunder and lightning flash, and I was scared. I was scared. I wasn't scared, I was scared. <laughs> the type of scariness that makes me want to run. Unlike the folk in the movies, when the danger comes, they run towards it. That's not of God. <laughs> when you hear the sound, it's not of God <laughs> turn the next way when these folks hear the sound of God they were afraid why because you're supposed to be afraid we've been taught to look at God so cavalierly I actually heard a pastor said well you should not be afraid of God but the scripture says fear him I'm confused it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and understanding. And I heard this joker say, telling people, well, you shouldn't fear God because he's your father and he loves you. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. I love my kids. Let me be disciplined in them. Tell me they ain't scared. Oh. And I ain't talking about no, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not speaking of reverence at this point. I'm saying scared because the lightning is about to come. And they're going to hear the sounds as peals of thunder. And the, when the thunder claps, pow! They start to speak in tongues. <laughs> If my kids feel that way, if I felt that way about my dad, you're trying to tell me we're not supposed to fear God. No, I think we have a wrong understanding. So when these folks get to heaven, everyone in heaven, they're shouting out. They're giving God praise. So verse 2 gives us the reason why they're rejoicing. Watch what it says. Because judgments, it says because his judgments are true. Now, why is it saying his judgments are true? Well, in John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me because he is truth, right? Now, watch this in John chapter 16, verse 13. He says, but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose what is to come. John chapter 8, verse 14 and 16. Jesus answered and said to them, even if I testify about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I come from and where I am going, but you do not know where I come from nor where I am going. Chapter 8, verse 26. I have many things to speak and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true. And the things which I, have, which I heard from him, these things I speak to the world. So Jesus is saying he came as the truth of God. He is the truth. When we see him, we see truth. When we hear him speak, we hear truth. But everything that comes from him is true. This is why he can literally judge the world because he is the truth. 
First John chapter 5, verse 20 says, And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true. In his Son, Jesus Christ. That is, the true God and eternal life. I don't think we, most Christians don't even understand who Jesus Christ is. Paul told the church in Colossae, he said that we don't know who we are. Who we are would not be revealed until Christ comes. Until then, it's a mystery. We have no idea what the afterlife, and it's not the afterlife, it's the beginning of eternal life. Imagine, people believe when they die, they lose something. No, when we die, we gain something. For Christians who are afraid to die, I find it peculiar. Now, no one wants to be in pain, i.e. me. So I get that. But you can't be afraid to die. I mean, when I say die, to leave this plane of existence. Because I can't wait to get to see the Father. I'm in no rush. Because I believe you have things for me to do, and I'm just not ready just yet. But I'm not afraid of it. Hear me. Because it's a blessing to those who are in Christ Jesus. It's our reward. It's when we get it. Revelation chapter 3, verse 7, and the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, he who is holy, who is true, who has the keys of David. Speaking of Jesus, this is why it says righteousness. Because his judgments are true and righteous. So his judgment is just, they're not only true, right? So he can righteously judge. I mean, he can judge because he is the standard of truth, but also because he is righteous. In John chapter 8, 16, but even if I do judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone in it, but I and the Father who sent me. Then we see here in Romans chapter 2, verse 5, he says, But because of the stubbornness of the unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. So Jesus is the righteous judge. We are deserving of judgment and, and condemnation. But based on the works of Christ Jesus, God the Father will bring us into his kingdom not because of what we do, but because of what Christ has done. So if we place our faith and trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ, based on Christ's finished work, God the Father then places us into his kingdom. Now, if we don't believe in Jesus Christ, i.e. what he said when he said in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, Go out into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to do all that I have commanded. Most Christians don't even know what that means because they don't know all that he has commanded because we're not studying. It's not the job of a pastor to place the word of God in your heart. Scripture says, as we go about to do the Awana ceremony, Study to show yourself approved as a workman who need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's what every Christian is called to do, not just the little ones. We're all supposed to hide the word of God in our hearts that we may not sin against him. So why is sin crouching at our door just like Cain? Because we haven't hidden the word of God in our hearts. The word of God is there so that we might not sin against him. It's a preventative measure. But we need to accept it. We see here this whole judgment in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. He says, in the future, Paul is telling Timothy, in the future there is later for me a crown of righteousness. I can't wait to get mine. Which the Lord, the righteous judge, has promised to all those who love him. Notice what it says. Which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only me, but also to all those who have loved his appearing. Wait a minute. So we will get the crown of righteousness if we are anxiously waiting on the appearing of Christ? No, look at what it said. Read it. Open your Bibles. No, seriously, read it. Look at your Bibles. <laughs> See what it says. 
if you are anxious and expecting and wanting Christ to return, you will receive a reward for anxiously expecting his return. What? I guess that's why he said in Matthew chapter 6, 13, our fa 9, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If the will of God is being done in your life, that means then we are anxiously expecting the return of Messiah. If we are not living in that expectation, we are losing something. But if we are, we gain something. We gain. I mean, it's so beautiful. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 8. But of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. So when Jesus comes, the reason why he is the true and the righteous judge and why he can do this is because it's his kingdom. So he made the rules. Wait a minute. Trying to tell me then that the Christian life isn't about me, how I feel, or what I think. You're trying to tell me it's all about Christ and his kingdom. You're trying to tell me Christ made all the rules, and I need to follow Christ's rules. But I was told that Christianity isn't about a bunch of do's and don'ts. I heard a pastor say that too. I'm like, if Christianity isn't about a bunch of do's and don'ts, don't I have to accept Christ? I start off having to do something. Don't I? I have to believe. When I believe, then I have to live out my faith. I have to work out my salvation with fear and trembling. I have to renew my mind. I have to draw near to God. I have to resist the devil. Oh my goodness, there's a lot of do's and don'ts. And then I have to do all that Christ has commanded me. I have to make disciples. <sighs> but it's not like that a bunch of do's and don'ts. It's just a lifestyle of serving. If you look at it as a bunch of do's and don'ts, it's probably because you're not in right relationship. It's not a bunch of do's and don'ts. It's just a relationship. In my marriage, it's not a bunch of do's and don'ts. It's just a relationship. We are the bride of Christ. So our relationship requires that we live in such a way to demonstrate that we are his bride. Because a few verses down, we're going to see why. So Revelation chapter 16, verse 7, And I heard in the altar saying, Yes, O Lord God, the Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. So here in verse 2, Because the judgments are true and righteous, for he has judged the great harlot who was corrupting the earth with her immorality, and he has avenged the blood of his bond servants on her. We see this here in Revelation chapter 17, verse 6. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. When I saw her, I wondered greatly. Now mind you, going back to Revelation chapter 17, this beast, this harlot, uh, Babylon, who is being judged in chapter 17 is the religious system. So listen very carefully, Christians. Listen very carefully, saints. Religion will come after you if you are truly living for Christ. What I mean by that, people who call themselves Christians. It's going to happen. It will happen. So when you see the church being so corrupted that major denominations are splitting over immoralities and they're elevating immorality just like the culture is, then you know it's an amalgamation of the religion and the culture. You know the beast is about to come. Not that it's here, but it's working things out to make its apparent, it's, it's appearing uh, much more seamlessly. See, because when the beast comes on the scene, it's going to be ripe for him to just take over. Now, of course, when I say the beast, I'm talking about the beast of the sea, which is the governmental system, and the person who runs the system, which is Antichrist. The beast from the earth, which happens to be the religious system, we see things now taking place in Christendom where you have Christians going where they call this thing inner faith prayers, where they're coming together and merging Bahá'u'lláh, Buddhism, Confucianism, Islam, Christianity, Judaism, and they're coming together and they're praying, and they're saying, well, it's the faith's praying. Uh-uh. No. -uh. Nah. Because they call me. I'm like, <laughs> you can 
can't tell me to hang out with Legion, Beelzebub, Abaddon, and Jesus. It sounds like a bad joke. I can't sit with some demons saying they're praying. Who they praying to? And calling it like, 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 um, um, uh, 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 love and uh, using terms like unity. <laughs> I don't want to be unified with you. I don't want to be because your unity will send me straight to hell. You need to understand Christ didn't come to bring peace on this earth and for us to hold our hands with Baal and Asherah and sing Kumbaya. Nah, he came to demonstrate that he's the one, the only, and the true God. Everything else is a lie. And I know some Christians, they're so scared. But well, Pastor Dave, you can't talk about other religions. <laughs> Demons. Don't have time to play that game. You need to know what you're fighting. It's demons. There ain't no such thing as other religions. It's just demonic entities guising themselves to be worshipped. That's not new. The thing right now that we're calling abortion, I told folks, I, I say this all the time, it's called Baal worship. It's right there in the book of Exodus. Read it. You will see it. The things that were all this blatant homosexuality, what do you think happened in Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis chapter 6? Do you think this is new? No. When the government takes over and make immorality the natural thing, God sends down fire. And it's going to come. <laughs> it's called the tribulation. So I'm not surprised by what I see. I'm just like, I am living, actually, Lord, I'm actually living in this era. Like, and I'm like, Lord, what do I do, right? But we know what to do. Love God with all of your heart, soul, and strength. Serve him. Tell people about him. Be willing to die for him. See, we haven't been trained to be willing to die. We haven't been trained to accept suffering and the burden of the cross. We haven't been trained to do that. You need to accept if you are a Christian, you will suffer persecution. That's what Paul says, right? 2 Timothy chapter 3. Evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. He says, because of this, I had suffered at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra. What persecutions I have endured, and out of them all, the Lord has delivered me. Now remember, he got murked. He got killed and came back. Yeah, read Acts, right? But when you see what it means to be Christian, and then you look at what's taking place in culture, you would feel lonely. I know I do. No matter where I go, I see sin. It bothers me. Can't, you can't watch anything. You can't listen to anything. The speech is perverted. Everything is perverted. And now they want you to accept perversion. See, that's the harlot. That's what she's going to do. The government is going to legislate these things. And this is why I tell Christians, election is coming up and people get so confused when I speak. So let me say this, and, I, and I'm going to keep saying this. I'm not speaking about you voting. I'm speaking about you tying yourself to a system. Vote for the person who you think can represent your viewpoints well. I just pray your viewpoints line up with God's. But in the midst of that, no. This world is going to be destroyed by fire. And it's not global warming either. Know this. God already said it's going to happen. The reason why it's going to happen is because of sin. And the government will rise up against Christ at Megiddo. And they will come and they will try to shoot him out of the sky with their rockets. And it's not going to work. He's going to open his mouth. Slaughter every military force on the planet. This is not our home. This is not your government. This is a foreign place that you are in. A temporary place. A trial period that you're going through. Your home is the kingdom of God. 
So when you live here, you live here as an ambassador of God, as a servant of Christ Jesus. Do not tie yourself with this system. Do not become Democrat or Republican. You can vote, yes. Vote for those morals and principles that lead your conscience based on the word of God. Yes, do that, you have to. But do not tie yourself to donkeys and elephants. Don't do it. Tie yourself to God, his kingdom, his righteousness. And watch what happens. So Revelation chapter 19, verse 3 to 4, and I close. And the second time they said, hallelujah. A smoke rises up forever and ever. So now judgment has came on this wicked government. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures, they fell down and they worship. Well, we saw this already, right? In Revelation chapter 4, verse 8. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings and full of eyes all around them within and about. They never cease to say holy, holy, holy. This is why I said there's two words said in heaven, holy and hallelujah. Because all these living creatures and the elders are saying is holy, holy, holy all the time. Notice what it says. They never cease to say what does it mean? Night and day, they do not cease. It means it's all they're saying. So you go to heaven, all you hear is, holy, holy, holy. <laughs> all the time. Holy, holy, holy. When it's not saying holy, hallelujah, hallelujah. I mean, you, you, you don't be like, man, is there another song? No. Because your mindset wouldn't even be where it is now. And the only thing you will want to say is holy. Because you will be in the presence of holiness. And then you will truly understand what he meant when he said, be holy for I am holy. You will realize, I can't. I need you to be holy in me. To make me fall before you to be holy. And when the living creatures... Give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever. The 24 elders will fall down. Watch this. Mm. They come, it says they fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever. And they will cast their rewards, their crowns, the rewards that was given to them, the crown of righteousness, the, the crown of peace. and uh, all, They will give their crowns to Christ, they will throw them off their heads and they'll bow down. The, the things that we call valuable, they say, uh uh, it means nothing. I just want you. Oh. That is worship, right? I mean, imagine if we respond like that right now. The, all the blessing that God gives us, all the possessions and all the things that we have, we say, Lord, um, um, this is for your glory. I just want you. Imagine if we would do that. Give our wives and our husbands, our children to God. Say, Lord, I, I want you. Watch what he does with that thing when you place it on the altar. Take your Isaac. Place it on the altar before God. And watch what he does in your life. Because there's always the ram that he sends for the sacrifice. When we believe that we're sacrificing something, and we give ourselves, and we give it as if though we believe it's going to be taken. He steps in, and he provides the sacrifice, and he blesses us. It's just what he does. Why? Because that's just who he is. Paul told Timothy, sorry, that was, James was saying that in him there's no variation or shifting shadow. Meaning God doesn't change his mind, his nature, his character, who he is. Who he is a million years ago is who he will be a million years from now. And when I say a million years, I'm speaking of eternity. Eternity past, eternity present, even in time right now, he is consistent. He will not change. He is who he is yesterday, today, and forever. And I, cl I said I close already. And a voice came from the throne of God giving praise to God. All you his bond servants, you who fear him, small and great. Then I heard something like the voice of a great multitude and like the sound of many waters 
like the sound of mighty peals of thunder saying hallelujah for the Lord our God the almighty reigns father we glorify you this day we thank you for who you are for all that you have done and for all that you are doing give us this day oh God what we need in order to come before you to give back to you the worship that you deserve you left us here on this earth oh God to demonstrate to this lost and dying world who you are to present the gospel of Christ Jesus to all those who are not in a relationship with him that they would know him that they would fear him, that they would love him, that they would serve him. Father, this day, if there is any who would be watching right now or sitting in this room, by the power of your spirit, would you draw them to you? For that individual who's being complacent in their faith, for that person who's been living a lukewarm life, for the person who's walked away and they're struggling with what it means to know Messiah. For that person who for the first time heard the gospel message. That because of your great love, you sent your son, God in flesh, to give his life a ransom for the many. That he was beaten hanged on a cross and died. He was buried in a rich man's tomb and rose in three days. Ascended and he sits at your right hand. You said in your word, O oh God, if we confess our sins, you are faithful, just, you will forgive us. We must repent and turn to Messiah. Jesus Christ the Lord so this day father for all of those under the sound of my voice no matter where they are in life will you speak to every heart will you speak to every mind will you convict us will you lead us even when we are faithless you will be faithful and you will not deny yourself we trust in your word we trust in you. In our weakness be our strength. Only you can lead us into truth by the power of your spirit. So we surrender ourselves to you, to your will, to your way, that your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen.